Hi, I'm David Jacek with Golf Week, golfweek.com, as well as USA Today Sports. I'm here with my buddy, Scott Austin. And we are here in Liberty, South Carolina at the TaylorMade Golf Ball Factory. And you're gonna give me a tour. Why don't we uh, head inside awesome. where it's a little bit warmer? Show me around a little bit. Let's see Good what we deal. see. Let's go. Cool. Scott, how long have you been working here in this factory? Well, actually, we built this factory in 2013. I got started in golf ball in 2006. So yeah, 10 years here, 17 years total. Gotcha. So about how many people are working here at this point? So we're right at 300 now. Okay. We first moved here in 2013, it was about 80. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so I'm looking here at what I presume, Scott, is at a whole bunch of cores and mantles. You are presuming right. So this is the mantle core that we get out of our two Asian plants. Yep. So this is the three constructions we're making right now. So two response is the green apple color, the gray is the 5X, and the blue is the TP5. And it sounds so simple, but obviously and things are shifting, getting moved around. I can see that there are barcodes and different codes yep. on there, but the colors also tell you what you're working with. Exactly, the color is the first thing you can see because it's kind of funny, we strategically make it for even people that are colorblind, so you can tell the difference. But that is the first idea that, hey, I know which ball type this is, mm -hmm. but then you're right, the barcode tells you where, when, what, when it was primed, how long it's been in there, everything. Okay, so this product here comes over from your Asian factories. How long does it take to actually get over there? I mean, you've got some very sophisticated factories over there that are making that product. How do you actually get it over here to South Carolina? Well, if you're on boat, it's about six weeks. I mean, if it's really, if it's really critical, you, know, you, you can airship it, yeah. yeah. But it's kind of funny, because we monitor, though, from when it was made at the plant yep. all the way through production, however long it takes to get here, we know size, weight, and speed where it's gonna be. But one of the amazing things about this is sort of like you get this blend of manufacturing, yeah. and then back over on the other side of the country in Carlsbad, you get engineers and designers who are working at actually making golf balls. I would imagine there has to be a pretty high level of communication between you guys because they can dream up whatever they want, right. but you guys have to be able to tell them like, yeah, we can make that. We've got the technology and right. all these engineers here. So how much do you talk back and forth with the folks on the West Coast? Too much. No, <laughs> I mean, seriously. No, it's, it's daily, if not hourly. Because yeah. what happens is you're right. In the lab, they're creating the most perfect golf ball. They're getting feedback from Colin and Rory saying, if you could only get me 200 more RPM on right. this shot, here the So they'll design the golf ball, right, based on history and based on our performance through the years, and they'll say, this is where we want it to be. And we'll have to make that mantle overseas mm -hmm. to those specs, bring it in, continue that spec. Yep. Then as we approach the lines here, we put the cover on, all that stuff is continually measured, size, yep. weight, and speed throughout the whole process yep. to make sure we make the most consistent, highest performing ball possible. Now, when a person's at home and they're maybe making dinner and a recipe calls for a teaspoon of this, half a cup of that, give me some measure and give people who may not be aware, some measure of the scale and how fine a measurements, some of the things, like when you're making a urethane cover on a TP5, TP5X ball, how thin are we talking about when we get into that urethane cover? Sure, so the TP5X is our thinnest cover. The tool response is right there on it too. It's 20 thousandths of an inch thick. That's the thinnest urethane cover out there, to my knowledge, yep. especially cast urethane. So 20 thousandths is gonna be, you know, you and I don't have a lot of hair left. <laughs> it's gonna say, don't go there, So man, come on. it's gonna be probably 10 or 11 hairs, okay, yeah. thick. And then, it's funny, that is the total thickness of the cover. So if I scallop out the dimple, yep. that is 11 or so thousandths deep. So the skin of the bottom of the dimple is half that 20,000. It is just wafer thin, right? You can yep. see through it. It's, it's really amazing. So for people who may not understand the process of using cast urethane, there's a couple different kinds of urethane. You can buy urethane in sure. pellets or in chopped up pieces, melt it down, go yep. ahead and make a golf ball. You guys do it differently. Explain to me how you yep. do it. So cast urethane is where I have a dimpled muffin pan, if you will, if you really want to lay it down, yeah. okay? A dimpled muffin pan, and my batter is my urethane. So I'm putting a shot of urethane in the bottom of that dimpled muffin pan, and I'm pushing in that mantled core, and it plumes up around the side and makes an impression that's half of that golf ball. Yep. I do the same thing on the other side, in a different piece of timing, Put those together. together and I'm making that two halves at a time. And you're basically gonna heat that up, put it under some level of pressure, and yes. then allow it to cool, because you gotta be able to pop that, that cake out of the spring form That's pan. Right. And I gotta have that pam in my muffin pan so they'll pop out, right? So gotcha. there's a certain amount of mold release that lets those balls come out without being deformed, right? Yep. Everybody's had the, the muffin that gets stuck and comes all to pieces, right? We don't want that to happen with golf balls. Yep. So once it comes out, there's a little bit of a ring around it where those two two halves knitted together sure, right that makes the ring around it that's almost like a, 
a spew ring or a leftover waste ring, yep. then that has got to be cut down to make it perfectly round again. Gotcha. And that's what these machines do here. So these are the buffing machines that take that ball, that takes that excess urethane around that yep. half that's where it's put together at the equator, trims that true, and sands it down and makes it perfectly round. Perfect. Okay, so now explain to me how you get the paint on, because once you get the excess material, yep. the urethane, off the golf ball, you've essentially got a golf ball. Absolutely, it looks but, like a golf ball. Right, but it's not something that people would open up a dozen box and play with. You've got to apply a paint, you've sure. also got to add some other covers. So walk me through what the rest right, of the well, process is. Remember the PAM and the muffin pan, right? Yep. That PAM is still on the ball, okay? okay? So first I got to get that off. So paint does not like mold release. So we go through a prep process where I thoroughly clean the ball mm -hmm. and open up all those little urethane pores, kind of like exfoliating your skin, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I want to open that up so my paint gets the best adhesion mechanically and chemically and holds on to it. Because okay. you don't want to hit a ball and the paint comes off, right? No, absolutely not. And the paint's got to move with it. So as the urethane moves, the paint has a flex agent in it as well. Okay. So once that ball is prepped, then I paint it with like an automotive paint spray process base coat, clear coat, like you're doing a, an automotive bumper, if you will. Mm -hmm. Then I have a white coated ball. Looks like a golf ball with no printing on it. Okay. Is there a glossy finish to it at that point, or is that sort of like a matte sort of finished looking looking white golf ball at that point? Another good question. After cleaning, it is a matte finish. Right. But then I'll go like a semi-gloss and a full gloss with those two coats. Yep. Then that gloss coat is ready to accept any of these printing processes, be it pad or digital, for the next operation of visual technology, then it is clear coated after that to seal in all that goodness, right? And give you the best performing golf ball out there as far as UV resistance, moisture resistance, grass stain resistance, cart path resistance in your case, <laughs> yes, you know, so. So obviously visual technologies have become a huge part of what TaylorMade is doing in the golf industry. Absolutely. Talk to me a little bit about how visual technologies and the application of actually making this stuff has changed. How do you guys, create some of the things like the My Symbol program and the, right. the Stripe program and such. How, how do you do it? Well, back back in 06 when I started, it was white ball, right? Yeah. And that was 95%. You had a little bit of custom logo. Yep. If you want a Packers logo, something on the side, you could do that. Corporate, yeah. But then it got to where, you know, the tour players are saying, hey, it'd be cool to get my own number, something that a lot of the other companies didn't do. Mm -hmm. And that evolved into the My Number. Then from My Number, we're like, well, what if you did this? What if you did this? And only recently has the USGA opened it up to where then I can do anything underneath the name. And you don't even have to technically have a number on the golf no. ball for number, right? Yeah. It doesn't doesn't matter. It can be DD instead of the number, right? I like where you're going with this. Yeah, I was gonna say stud, but anyway. As far as the USGA, yep. until they opened that up, we couldn't even color the name different. It had yep. to be like black name, tailor-made, yep. had to be a number or something on the, the keyboard. Now, mm -hmm. as far as the side stamp, that still holds true. The side stamp still has to be registered. Black has to be something on an ASCII keyboard, way. right? Yep. But yeah, so what that did is that really made us open up the way we print because we could do a lot of different things. We had a great way of just doing numbers only, mm -hmm. but then the numbers were limited to two digits. Now I can put a zip code on the ball. Gotcha. It doesn't matter. So you guys have put a lot of work and spent a lot of money in technology and researching how you actually print on a golf ball, which I think a lot of people probably underappreciate because they think, well, you can just put whatever you want on there. Right. It's it's not that it's not simple to print on a sphere, basically, and to make sure that the orientation of the numbers and the letters and yeah. the symbols is every way it needs to be because golfers are finicky. Like if things oh. don't line up, they don't want to see it. So what have you guys done to try and make that happen? Well, in performance, because there's companies out there that'll take our golf ball and print stuff on it. But then how long does it last? Does it affect flight? Yep. So all of ours is about performance. Everything we do has performance in mind because all of this stuff is under the clear coat. Mm -hmm. So nothing is on top of the clear coat that would affect flight in any of these instances. Yep. So we have to do something as far as inks. Remember we're talking about chemistry. Mm -hmm. We have to have an ink that is compatible that can be on top of the white, under the clear, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And then it can stand a few hundred hits before you lose it, right? Mm -hmm. Or before you're tired of that golf yeah, ball yeah. and blame a bogey on it or something. So that's how it evolved. And then all the colors of the rainbow, right? Because yep. it used to be where, oh, I can only do black or red. Well, now the colors are anything you want them to be. Gotcha. Okay, so once the golf balls have gotten all their paint, they've gotten their clear coat, everything is finished, you've got final product. We've got some big bins of a whole yeah. bunch of golf balls you right here. You may help you get in one of them. You're yeah, right? I mean, so how do you get these into packages and then off either to pro shops or to consumers? Good question, because there's about 15,000 golf balls in here. And these are all, look, these are all number threes. 
So we want to match them up to a set. So yep. long before my time and maybe before your time, they've been going four different numbers in a dozen, right? Yep. And it was one, two, three, four for the longest time. So we stopped doing fours back in like 08. Yeah, I We remember. figured out four is uh, very close to the Asian word for death in some cultures. Nobody so wants that. Nobody wants the death ball. So then we went one, two, three, five, with starting with Penta. We've been one, two, three, five ever since yep. on a five piece and zero, one, two, three on a three piece or below. So what happens is now I'll put four of these row packs, as we call it, up on these stands and they will separate one, two, three, five. So I got four tracks going up four tracks, that are yep. one, two, three, five down the tubes into their own sleeve. Gotcha. Perfect. Listen, Scott, it's been really cool from seeing how golf balls are basically manufactured, how they're produced, how they go out the door. Yeah, man. Really, really cool stuff. Thanks a lot for the Appreciate tour. you guys. Thanks for everything. Thanks, you guys. Yeah,